afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. What I want to do is touch on 10, 10 ways we're moving ahead here in the core of the lakes. It's not as bad as it sounds. I'll get through them pretty quick, don't worry. Um, but it has been quite a journey to this point. There's lots of things we could talk about, um, but I want to focus today on, on where we are and really where we are going. Um, we have a great vision here in the city and, uh, and the future ahead is very bright as we keep striving for that stability uh, that I think is so important in municipalities these days. Um, so I want to talk about 10 ways we are moving ahead, why the future looks good and why I'm excited about the direction we are taking. But first, let me say thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, you are the drivers of our economy and uh, it's always fun to come and talk to the Chamber of Commerce because when we talk about growth, it is your businesses that attract newcomers um, and visitors that hire those workers and sponsor local events in our community like this one. So you are the, certainly the core of the lakes and what helps make it work. So thanks very much for what you do uh, as, as business people in our community. So our number one issue, number one, we'll start with roads, a big surprise, uh, ways we're moving forward in our municipality. Um, roads are by far our number one issue and certainly our biggest challenge. Uh, we now, as a municipality, spend $50 million a year on our roads. We have 5,400 kilometers of lane roads in the Kawartha Lakes. Uh, it's a huge network and that is pretty close to the distance if you drove from one coast to Canada to the other. So just to put it into perspective, we have uh, a little slide here when we talk about how much we spend on roads and why it's such a challenge to get ahead of them, we spend 90% more on roads now than we did 10 years ago. But when is it enough? Uh, and why are we struggling so much with our roads to try and get ahead of them? So if we put that challenge in perspective for you, um, we have a large area, we have many roads and a sparse population. And if you look at this comparison with Toronto, they have 80 property owners for every kilometer of, of road. We have seven. We spend 35 cents of every tax dollar on roads. They spend five cents of every tax dollar on roads. Even Peterborough has 37 households per lane kilometer and spends 20 cents of every tax dollar uh, on roads. And to put that even more into perspective, the average residential taxes in Toronto are $3,020 per household. Peterborough, the average taxes are $3,064 per household. And in Kawartha Lakes, the average taxes are $2,700 per household. So when people say we're overtaxed, I can prove we're not. Not necessarily how everybody feels. We also spend 50% more on winter control uh, in the city than we did a decade ago. We used to have about 40 winter events every year, uh, on average a year. Last winter we had 57. Uh, it can be a snowfall, can be a freezing rain event. Uh, these are all treated very differently with the way we treat our roads. And each event that we have in the municipality of our roads cost us about $125,000. So again, with the 5,400 lane kilometers that we treat, plow, sand, and clear, we do that all within 10 hours. That's our level of service that we offer for our winter control. So I'm not trying to say we're failing. I'm just trying to say it's a challenge. And when people say, how come we don't do a better job with, uh, with some of our roads? It's we're trying, we're getting ahead of it. I truly believe we are. It's just not easy. Uh, the changing climate certainly doesn't help. Uh, we need to change the way we do business, and we are. It won't happen overnight, but we are getting there. Uh, I know walleye season opened last weekend, so uh, this fellow looks like he's getting a jump on it. So, as we, it's good with potholes to poke fun at yourself sometimes. So number two, number two, what I'd like to talk a little bit about is our downtowns. Um, it's a great success story. We're investing in new infrastructure, roads and sidewalks uh, in Lindsay. It was last done in the early 1900s, so they are certainly crumbling and starting to break under the ground. So we need to increase, and we also need to increase the capacity for growth and give it a new refreshing look to be more pedestrian friendly in our downtowns. And we are certainly, uh, we're doing that. So as you can probably tell, Peel and Russell Street in Lindsay are being done this year. Kent Street is projected to be done next year. You will certainly notice it, it's gonna be a mess, there's no doubt about it. 
but a very exciting project in the long run. You have told us that our downtowns are very important as hubs in our communities, and we are giving them the refresh that they deserve. Signage, street lights, benches, and crosswalks. They are also important social and economic hubs for the next generation. So be assured, that is why we didn't rush this process, and there was a lot of public consultation was involved for Lindsay, actually started back in 2013. So there's been lots of opportunity for input from many of our stakeholders. This is a $6 million project just for Peel and Russell alone, not counting the downtown. We're very excited about it, and we're even more excited that Fenland Falls will be starting next year, or this year with the consultations to hopefully get that their downtown with the same kind of refresh that we're doing in Lindsay, uh, if not next year, shortly after. So I put that in for our Fenland crowd. We're working on it. Um, number three is community improvement. Never has more money been available to enhance our downtown communities. Um, the million dollar makeover, uh, revitalization committees and volunteers have been bringing ideas forward and businesses are investing in their properties with grant and low interest funding opportunities. We have had great success with the initial uptake and the second intake is scheduled for this summer and is open right now. The whole city was considered by council as a community improvement area and this funding can be for more can be for more attractive facades, for lighting, for signage, as well as affordable housing above a business, or for accessibility on a patio or inside your business. There are lots of opportunities available, so if you're thinking about doing something with your business, jump all over this one. Partners like Community Futures uh, continue to show leadership by investing in our communities, and Council has invested an additional $100,000 in the 219 budget for new and expanded grant opportunities citywide as part of the uh, community improvement project. We have awarded $400,000 across the city in the first intake and have another $700,000 available right now for the second intake over the summer. So number four, creative economy. And Susan left, but she said the table was gonna take notes that I talked about the creative economy. So arts, culture, and heritage, I've heard people say is a special interest group. Certainly not a special interest group unless a $27 billion economy and 300,000 jobs in Ontario is considered of special interest. Uh, it sure has me interested. The municipality is investing in this real and exciting tourist driving economy and I think the best is yet to come. By working together, this citywide arts and culture group is gaining momentum. A newly formed working group is exploring the terms of reference for a feasibility study of a cultural center and hub in the Quartha Lakes. Council has approved an extra staff person to look after the heritage portfolio so that we can better focus on this growing industry. We need to keep the excitement going on this, a lot with our live theaters, new ideas coming up from the Academy Theater all the time, the Arts Trail, museums across the city. We had our very first spotlight on agriculture earlier in the year. It was a big gala to recognize those in our agricultural community. And just last week, they held the first cultural summit at the Lakeview Arts Barn and Bob Cajun. This is how we become a complete community, by offering something for everyone. And I say keep your eye on this one because it's gonna take off. It's gonna be a real driver. So number five ways we're moving forward is attracting a new workforce. We're attracting people from the GTA. Young, vibrant entrepreneurs are moving here with new and exciting ideas and jobs. Economic development has focused on bringing the people here who will invest in our community in tech and green initiatives. This new and exciting workforce brings a fresh and different perspective to our community. Our small business and entrepreneurship center helps with development, coaching, and the connection to funding sources that new and growing businesses need. This is Sarah Fernier. Uh, she moved here with her family from Toronto and started an eco-friendly food wrap business. Uh, it's wax paper made out of bees, beeswax, something like that, eco-friendly. Uh, came up here from Toronto with her family, started up a great business. Our tourism and access to water and year-round fun has always attracted visitors. More and more of those visitors are now choosing to relocate and live here. Some are actually transitioning their businesses here as well. We have what they need, and our high-speed capacity is increasing all the time. 
and our $215 million cell gap project will only make that better. Speaking of getting better, we have a great mix of restaurants, shopping, and culture in this community that certainly helps add to the draw. This is Graham Barry uh, from Net Mechanics. Uh, he brought a cybersecurity business here from Bruce County. We also have a very supportive business community that welcomes newcomers. We need to find spaces for them to set up or live and work from home. The Peterborough Innovation Cluster is looking to set up in Lindsay and we certainly welcome that partnership. And both of these folks that you see here were both part of our starter company plus program that economic development puts on. So numbers, there's our, there's our attracting our new workforce to, to come up here and sit on the dock and work. New residential, I always, I, I have a thing that whenever we talk about economic development at the city, um, if you go into City Hall and some of our boardrooms, we have these pictures all over the walls and every picture is of, can you go back to that picture? Every picture is of somebody sitting on a dock or sleeping in a canoe or doing something that is a whole lot of nothing. And I always say, this is great. This is great for tourism. I know we want to attract our business, our people here to come up and relax, but there's more to Kawartha Lakes than sleeping in a canoe or sitting on a dock. And so I'm trying to talk them into having a mix of pictures, a little bit of both, where maybe we could show some businesses, people working, other people enjoying. <laughs> A little bit of both, you know, that com complete community we're trying to create. So uh, I'm working on it. So residential growth is our, is our number six. So new residential developments are popping up all over the city. Some smaller developments are happening in our rural hamlets, which are very much needed, and larger ones in our urban centers. Fenlon, Bob Cajun, and Lindsay certainly continue to lead the charge with well over a thousand homes currently in the immediate system for development. This growth with that new workforce is very much needed to maintain a healthy community. The craft application alone at 35 in Coburn is for 540 homes. We have successful lobbied the provincial government for changes to the growth plan to allow for more flexibility in the way rural communities grow and create a model that fits with our vision of growth and not that of the GTA. So this is certainly not what we're looking to create in, uh, in Omimi or any of our communities. So, uh, we just wanted to say this is, this is what not to do. Good, solid, contained growth. So number seven is our commercial and industrial growth, which is something that I'm, uh, we're very focused on as a council uh, this year. Uh, certainly along with the residential growth is the needed commercial and industrial economy. We are targeting incentives for development charges in the next bylaw to help stimulate jobs and that commercial and industrial tax base. This is crucial and I believe we need to aggressively put a plan in place moving forward for next year. The next few years are critical to taking the pressure off our tax base and our water and wastewater users by increasing the base that actually utilizes it. It might involve investing now for greater returns down the road. We will see what the numbers show with different scenarios. We can't do it by residential growth alone. Young working families need jobs and small businesses need good hard-working employees. And I know that can be a challenge for some of you. They all need attainable housing to be part of our growing economy. We have put the foundation and capacity in place to accommodate this over the last bunch of years, to accommodate this growth, and I believe the time to pull out all the stops and be aggressive is right now. There will never be a better time to get on top of this. Yes, that's a picture of a Walmart. <laughs> Relationships with other levels of government, number eight. This has been great improvement in this area. Um, although it is hard to stay ahead of our provincial government and their new ideas coming forward right now, uh, there is also great opportunity for our municipality to work together and find better ways if possible. Um, we're certainly never gonna find them if we don't look. So we are, no longer, we are no longer looked at as a whiny little complainer that always has his hand out, um, isn't happy about anything and blames everyone else for their woes. We are now looked upon as a progressive leader in the province. We are much more self-sufficient and not so reliant on others for everything we do. I can now confidently stand in front of you and say we are ahead of many other municipalities in the province when it comes to the business of the city. This has been a huge turnaround for us and one that I'm really proud of. Number nine, large community projects. Uh, we're making some major investments uh, across the municipality. 
Uh, Logie Park is one of the investments uh, as a gateway into Lindsay. You're going to see some major work being done there over the summer. We're going to put in a splash pad you can skate on in the winter. Three large play structures, a pavilion, a flag garden, a waterfront lookout, bus parking, heated accessible change rooms and washrooms, and an accessibility display of lilacs throughout the park. We're in the process, we're also in the process of converting the Bob Cajun Beach Park from a trailer park into a world-class park the whole city will enjoy. There'll be lots more docking, lots more day activities, a band shell, kids area, waterfront boardwalk, and more. It will truly be something for everyone. And last I heard, the Grand Hotel redevelopment uh, is moving forward in the fall. I'm glad Charlie's not here because he might have a different opinion. Um, <laughs> it's moving ahead in the fall. Uh, phase two at Adelaide Place, you can see, is, is well underway. That's been a great successful project. The old Fleetwood building has been sold and looking to start manufacturing again. And yes, grow up is manufacturing. The old Trent rubber property beside the college has got some new plans of what they want to do. And yes, I do believe a Walmart will be coming very, very soon. As I mentioned before, plans for a Kawartha Lakes business incubator are also underway. And the broadband and cell gap coverage has always been a number one priority for all of Eastern Ontario. Kawartha Lakes is investing almost a million dollars in this latest project because we heard it is critical to our business community. Not only do we need the capacity, we need to be able to access it. Funding commitments from other levels of government are very close to finally moving ahead with this project and we are expecting confirmation on the funding very, very shortly. And that's a $215 million project across Eastern Ontario that we're a big part of. So number 10, uh, last but not least, is uh, I like to think I saved the best for last, financial sustainability. Certainly one of the areas that I am the most proud of over the last five years. We've come a long way in a few short years. And I want to share, if you'll bear with me, just a few facts and numbers for the sponsor. I wanted to put some numbers together for the sponsor table because they're accountants, right? So we have a budget of $250 million as a municipality. Taxes or tax support reserves bring in about 60% of that amount. And the balance of, of, of our funding is funded through user fees, development charges, grants from other levels of government, etc. There's a quick chart here on how taxes are spent, if you can see that, but it's uh, roads is our largest expenditure in public works in the city's tax supported budget. Next is emergency services, police, fire and paramedics. Whether you use them or not, we have to have them. About 35% of operating budget is our people at the city. Being a service-oriented business, we need people to do the job. Uh, we have the right number of people doing the job, and they're doing a good job. The percentage of overall staff costs to the budget ratio compared to other municipalities is very, very low. So when people say we're overstaffed at the city, they're not basing it on true facts. So I want to talk for a minute about reserves. Uh, reserves at the city, and I'm just trying to give you a little overview of the financial situation. Reserves, as you know, like a savings account. We have total reserves at the city at the end of 2018 of about $66.4 million. $37.1 million was for specific purposes, restricted reserves like the Lindsay Chess Fund, uh, Fenland Chess Fund, Bob Cajun Chess Funds. $24.6 million for repair and replacement of our assets. That sounds like a lot of money, but with $3.2 billion in assets, that's less than 1% of the total value. And we have about 4.2 million of city reserves are uncommitted or for contingency. And for the unexpected, whether it's a download from the province or a reduction in funding or for an emergency, that's what we use our contingency reserve for. Building this reserve has been a focus of the last council because it was down to almost zero. And it's been a very recent development. It seems to be much easier to spend money than to save it, go figure. But we've had a good turnaround on our reserves. So on our debt, if we'll flip over to debt, uh, debt, the city has about $115 million in debt as a municipality. This includes the 25 million we borrowed from our financial plan very recently in the last couple of years. About 42 million is for the repair and replacement of our water and wastewater infrastructure. Providing safe drinking water is a priority in the municipality and it should be. It's very expensive to maintain all that infrastructure 
Hence, we have fairly high water rates in the city of Kortha Lakes. Approximately 21 million of debt is for repair and replacement of our roads and landfill sites. The Northwest Trunk Sewer, we incurred a debt of about 20, $12 million is what's left on that. And we have a debt on our development charges account of about $10 million. These two debts, these last two, the 12 and the 10, were necessary to ensure the city can accommodate growth. And those debts are paid for by the development community, not the taxpayer. We also have about $7 million in debt for Kawartha Lakes Housing Corporation to support affordable housing. This is funded from the rents the city collects from the housing. So just to put that into perspective, if you had, if you brought it down to, if we had a salary of 60,000, if you had a salary of $60,000, it would be similar to having a $25,000 mortgage, $15,000 in your savings account. So when people say our city is mired in debt or we're out of control in our spending, they're not even close. We're, in, we're, we're very responsible with our money. We're very responsible with our debt. And I once had a very wise accountant told me, the, wise, the, the good utilization of your debt is a good way to do business. That was you, Mr. Mary. <laughs> Several years ago, we borrowed $25 million, as I mentioned, as part of our long-term financial plan to help close the infrastructure gap. This will save us in the long run, as we are now able to catch up faster and fix things before they break for a change. It is good business to utilize our ample debt capacity over 10 years to catch up on what we have been neglecting for a long, long time. That 25 million that we borrowed on a fixed loan is paid down every single year and will be paid off by 2027. Our financial relationship with the province is changing weekly, daily. And it's a clear message that municipalities need to be more resilient, more self-sufficient, sustainable and stable. And the core review that we did several years ago certainly got us out ahead of this. Uh, many municipalities are, are now looking at going through that process we went through several years ago, so we're in a good position. We have received $725,000 in transitional funding from the provincial government this year and a one-time federal gas tax payment of $4.6 million, which is our annual federal gas tax payment, but they've given us this year a one-time double of that gas tax for federal. So it sounds like free money, uh, but it's not. I mean, if we, we, we know nothing's for free. If we accelerate our financial plan and we don't add new projects to what it is that we need to do, we will have many, many options in the future moving forward. It's taken us a long time to get here, but that's a big if, because we have a lot of people who see this as an opportunity to increase spending and add services to the municipality. It's this, in my opinion, would be a huge mistake right now. This funding must be used to become less dependent on other levels of government. We know that funding will decrease over time. It is a given because the way governments do business and deliver their services has to change. It will either change by choice or it will change by necessity, but it will change. So, in wrapping up, there is much to be excited about. We've been taking care of our roads, our downtowns, our new parks, recreational facilities, investing in arts and culture, and we certainly turn the finances around most of all. We're starting to think and act as one entity, and it is certainly starting to pay off. Decisions we have made are allowing us to start building things instead of just fixing them when they break all the time. Change is inevitable. And I think we're in the middle of a lot of change. We just need to do it responsibly and be inclusive and explain the truth to people. Don't spin it, just lay it out and justify it. Be honest. But we have to be a little more open-minded as well. We are all seem to be for change as long as it doesn't affect us. But it must affect us to be effective. We don't have to like it, we just have to accept it because it's not always about us. We owe the next generation some of the same opportunities we have had, don't we? Those are not mine. <laughs> Thank you for coming today um, and helping drive some of these projects forward and for growing our economy with your work each and every day. We all have a role to play 
and together we are moving forward to a much more vibrant, affordable, and exciting Kawartha Lakes. I really believe that. And thank you again to Lindsay and District Chamber of Commerce and Baker Tilly for sponsoring this event. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.